Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning dear students, welcome to my class. This is the third lecture of this course. The title of this lecture is European Settlements. In this previous lectures, we have seen that one of the effects of the decline and disintegration of the Mughal Empire was the establishment of colonial power in India. Let us have a look at how the British emerged victorious and established their power in India. Who were the major European traders reached India and how finally the British emerged victorious. It was not in modern period, the British or uh, other Europeans came to India for trade. India's trade relations with Europe go back to the days of the Greek. During the early centuries of Christian era, South India during the Sangam period maintained brisk trade relations with the Roman Empire. From 1st century AD to 5th century AD till the decline of the Romans, South India had maintained brisk trade relations with Rome. In the medieval period as well, there was trade relations between India and Europe through several routes. In the Asian part, this trade was monopolized by the Arabs, while on the Mediterranean and European part, who did monopolize the trade? Italians. The Italians played the role of Arabs in Asia at the Mediterranean and European part. It means that the goods from India went to Europe through many states and many hands. However, the goods reached Europe through several hands, the trade was highly profitable. Earlier the trade was through Asia Minor and Constantinople. Constantinople was the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. But in 1453, the Turks captured Constantinople and Asia Minor. So, it was not possible to trade through Constantinople since it had been occupied by the Turks. So, new route was it to be discovered. In addition to the blockage of transport through Asia Minor and Constantinople, the merchant of Venice and Geneva monopolized the trade between Asia and Europe. These Venetian and Genevian merchants did not allow the new nation states of Western Europe, Portugal, Spain, French and Britain to have any share 
through these old trade routes, especially Spain and Portugal. Spain and Portugal were not allowed to engage in trading activities through this earlier route. So, the West European countries, particularly Portugal and Spain, began to search for new trade route to India and the Spice Islands of Indonesia. The Spice Islands of Indonesia during this time came into known as East Indies. These West European countries aimed to enter the monopoly of the both the Arab and Venetian traders and they wanted to engage in direct trade relations with India and East Indies. In addition to that, they also wanted to bypass the Turkish hostility, the Turks who had occupied the trade routes connecting Asia and Europe at Constantinople in 1453. So, the West European countries of Portugal, Spain was eagerly looked for finding new trade routes connecting Asia and Europe. They were helped in this task by advances in shipbuilding and the science of navigation. These two factors helped the West European countries to find new trade routes connecting Europe and Asia. These two countries came forward to find a new trade route from Europe to Asia. Their mission was sponsored by the respective governments. Governments also came forward to find new trade routes. Thus, a new era of geographical discoveries began. In 1492, Christopher Columbus of Spain started journey to reach India, but he discovered America instead of. Till his death, he was not aware that he had discovered America. In 1498, another Portuguese traveller, his name was Vasco da Gama, he discovered a new trade route from Europe to India. Vasco da Gama, a Portuguese traveller who discovered the first trade route through sea connecting Europe and Asia. Trade routes through land had already been there, but trade route through sea was first discovered by Vasco da Gama. How did he come from Europe to India? He sailed around Cape of Good Hope in Africa and reached Calicut in present day Kerala on Malabar coast. He started his journey from Lisbon. Vasco da Gama started his journey from Lisbon in 1498 and he reached Calicut on Malabar coast after spending 10 months and 14 days. What was the main purpose behind Vasco da Gama's travel expedition? The main purpose was to seek Christians and spices, to get converts into Christianity and get to spices were the major intentions behind Vasco da Gama's expedition. He returned with a cargo which sold 60 times the cost of his voyage. He returned from Calicut with immense wealth. This navigational discoveries connecting Europe and Asia through sea opened a new chapter in the history of the world. 
following the discovery of new trade routes connecting India and Europe, the following centuries of 17th and 18th centuries witnessed enormous trade relations between India and Europe. In addition to India, America was also opened to Europe. With the discovery of this new trade route, the relations between Asia and Europe completely transferred. As you have been told earlier, the Arab merchants who monopolized trade in the Indian Ocean, but within a very short span of time, the Portuguese was able to destroy the Arab monopoly of navigation. The Portuguese established trading points on land called Feitorias. These Feitorias were unfortified trading outposts, which served as a strategic base for naval fleet. In Calicut, the Portuguese entered into conflict with Samarin. He was the ruler of Calicut. When the Samarin was not ready to expel the Arabs who had monopolized trade from his port, but the Portuguese cleverly played off the Raja of Cochin against the Calicut. The Samarin of Calicut and Raja of Cochin were greatest enemies. The Portuguese supported Raja of Cochin against the Samarin of Calicut, following which the Portuguese was able to construct their first port on the Malabar territory owned by the Raja of Cochin. The Samarin did not allow fortification, but his enemy Raja of Cochin with whom the Portuguese ended friendly relations against the Samarin of Calicut got the opportunity to establish their first port on Malabar coast. Portuguese captured Goa in 1510. Since then, Goa became one of the major centers of Portuguese power in, a, in India. Under the viceroyalty of Albuquerque, they established their domination from the Asian coast in the over Asian coast from Hormuz in Persian Gulf to Malacca in Malaya and Spice Islands in Indonesia. Under the leadership of Portuguese Viceroy Albuquerque, the Portuguese established their domination from Hormuz in the Persian Gulf to Malacca in Malaya and Spice Islands in Indonesia. Till the beginning of the 16th century, the Portuguese was able to monopolize trade with Asia. In addition to normal methods, the Portuguese deployed various kinds of methods to extract money from Indian ships. One of the prominent fraud was cartel system. This was used by the Portuguese to extract plunder and money from the Indian ships. Under this system, a license was to be obtained by the captains of all Indian ships to navigate to a destination not reserved by the Portuguese from the Viceroy of Goa. The Viceroy of Goa issued the license. 
if no license the portuguese would capture the ship and merchandise if the captain got the license from the viceroy of goa the ship and its merchandise would not be captured this system came in known as carte system even the, this period the moguls with a powerful army and a strong administration was in existence since the port moguls had not interesting in developing a strong army the portuguese could withstand this the moguls had not interested in developing a strong army moreover south india was outside the control of the moguls it also helped the portuguese to engaging in trading activities the portuguese got a profit not only from spice trade they were also the carriers between other asian countries they purchased art manufactured products or other articles spices from one asian country and sold it in another asian country likewise persian carpets reached to india the portuguese purchased persian carpets and sold it to india likewise the portuguese purchased copper and silver from japan and sold it to china they served as the intermediaries in trade the portuguese monopoly in trade did not last long by the first decades of the 17th century most of the portuguese empire in the east collapsed in competition with the dutch who emerged powerful the dutch emerged powerful most of the portuguese settlements were occupied by the dutch in addition to the superior dutch power there were certain other reasons which paved the way for the decline of the portuguese power it included in 1580 portugal became the part of spain in 1588 spanish armada was defeated by the english so it was it be considered not only the defeat faced by the spain but also the defeat of the portuguese because portuguese was then the part of spain in addition to that the indian development in portugal also resulted the decline of the portuguese influence in maritime trade the aristocracy dominated the portuguese society and the merchants did not enjoy the necessary influence to formulate state policies according to the interests of the merchants because the society was dominated by the aristocracy not by the merchants next the crown was an autocratic ruler the interest of the merchants was not considered by the crown the portuguese was religiously intolerant and fanatic wherever they went they tried to convert the local population into christianity they were religiously intolerant and forcibly converted other religious group into christianity no doubt it attracted opposition from the local population 
as a result of all these, the Portuguese influence got confined to certain pockets of Goa, Daman, and Diu, the rise of Dutch. The Portuguese position was taken away by the Dutch by the middle of the 17th century. As far as Dutch was considered, they had superior shipbuilding technology with easy movement of ships, they mastered in shipbuilding. The Dutch company, the Dutch East India Company was created in 1602 from Holland, the Dutch came from Holland. The Dutch who came from Holland got through a royal charter the power to make wars, treaties and fortification of territories. All these powers were received by the Dutch United Company through the royal charter. The main interest of the Dutch was in the Indonesian archipelago and spice islands. Initially, they did not have any interest in trade with India, their attention was in Indonesian archipelago and spice islands. But soon, the Dutch realized the fact that Indian trade was necessary to carry on trade with the Southeast, Southeast Asian countries. Southeast Asian countries of Indonesia, Java, Sumatra and Malaya. There was a good demand of Indian cloth in Southeast Asia as well. The Dutch was well aware that they could purchase from Southeast Asia and sell it in India and in return purchase Indian articles and sell it in Southeast Asian countries. For example, Indian cloth which enjoyed great demand in Southeast Asian countries of Indonesia, Java, Sumatra, Malaya. So, the Dutch purchased Indian cloth and sold it in Southeast Asian countries. In return, Indians got pepper and spices from Southeast Asian countries. During this time, Gujarat and Coromandel coast, these two regions produced a large variety of cotton cloth. The Dutch purchased these different varieties of cotton cloth manufactured in Gujarat and the Coromandel coast and sold it in Southeast Asian countries and got much profit. In 1606, another development took place. The Dutch obtained from the king, king of Golconde to set up a factory in Masuli Patanam. In 1606, through a royal fireman from the king of Golconde, the Dutch got the right to establish a factory at Masuli Patanam. Following the establishment of factory at Masuli Patanam, the Dutch was able to establish their trade centers in different parts of the country, Nagapattanam in Madras, Cochin, Surat, Kambe and Baruch. In these places, trade centers were established by the Dutch. In addition to that, more trading points were also set up in Chinsure in Bengal, Agra in Uttar Pradesh and Patna in Bihar by the Dutch. In all these places, the Dutch established trading depots. The D Dutch engaged in trading of indigo, saltpeter, opium, 
raw silk and cotton. The Dutch was also able to capture the earlier position which had been enjoyed by the Portuguese in inner Asian trade. The Dutch captured Malacca in 1641. Colombo in 1655-56 and Cochin during the period between 15, 1659 and 1663. Overall, the Dutch replaced Portuguese in trading activity, but the Dutch had it to contend with another powerful rival who was this rival, it was none other than the British Hills. Now, we are going to see the emergence of the British. As you know, the English East India Company, which was created in 1600 through a royal charter. Under this charter of 1600, it granted the exclusive privileges to English East India Company to engage in trade with the area east of the Hudhoop for 15 years. For the right to trade was given to English East India Company only for 15 years, but it was extended at the elapse of 15 years each time. English East India Company initially was a smaller company compared to Dutch United Company. English East India Company was managed by a court of directors consisting of 24 directors. They were annually elected by the general court of shareholders. The shareholders annually elected these 24 court of directors, they managed the affairs of the English East India Company. So, the government did not uh, directly control English East India Company, but the shareholders elected the 24 court of directors who in turn managed the affairs of the English East India Company. First of all, the English East India Company wanted to establish a factory at Surat. For this purpose, the company sent William Hawkins to the court of Mughal ruler Jahangir. But due to the interviews of Portuguese, Hawkins could not meet the Mughal ruler Jahangir. He left Agra without meeting the Mughal ruler Jahangir. From this, it became clear to the British that first they would deal with the Portuguese before head getting favours from the Mughal ruler. However, the English was able to establish a factory at Masuli Patanam on the east coast in 1611. Likewise, the English was also able to defeat the Portuguese at Surat in 1611. In 1613, Jahangir allowed the English to set up a factory at Surat. After the establishment of English factories in Masuli Patanam and Surat, the British opened factories in different parts of the country. In 1615, in 1615, Sir Thomas Roy he was sent as an ambassador to the Mughal court to meet 
Jahangir to obtain a royal favor and this was granted Jahangir granted royal firman to Thomas Roy in 1615 under this royal firman granted by Jahangir in 1615 to Sir Thomas Roy the English got the right to trade and set up factories in all parts of the Mughal empire in 1615 the english got the right to establish factories in all parts of the mughal empire another naval battle between the portuguese and the english took place in 1620 in this battle the english emerged victorious the british was able to expel the portuguese from googly in 1633 through the intervention of the mughal forces in by 1623 english factories were set up in western coast of brauj ahmedabad and surat in these places english factories were set up the mughal authorities did not allow the british to fortify their settlements so the british turned their attention to the south india to evade the control of the mughals mughals the south india during this time was not under the control of the mughals so in order to evade the control of the mughals the british extended their attention to south india as you know in south india the powerful vijayanagara empire had already been overthrown in 1565 through the battle of talikota and in the place of vijayanagara empire several small states were emerged the smaller states were incapable to fight against these colon european powers of portuguese dutch or english in 1639 the british was able to obtain madras on the coromandel coast on a lease from the local raja agreeing the payment of half of the customs revenue to the local raja the british also got the right to fortify and mint coins in this place of madras the english set up a factory as well as built a fort this fort came in known as fort st george it was created in madras in 1662 king charles second of england received bombay as dowry on marrying a portuguese princess then what british crown did the british crown transferred bombay to the english east india company in 1665 after 3 years he got it as a dowry from the portuguese bombay was soon fortified earlier in western india the britishers concentrated at surat but because of the stiff opposition from the marathas as well as bombay offered a good opportunity of a good port because of these reasons the british shifted from surat to bombay as the principal depot of the company on the west coast 
Now, coming to Eastern India, in Eastern India, the power of the English East India Company rose only after 1630. In 1633, factories were established at Balasore in Orissa. In 1651, another factory was established in Hooghly in Bengal. In addition to these factories on eastern India, more factories were established in Patna, Dhaka and Kasim Besar in eastern India by the British. In 1658, all the establishments of Bengal, Bihar and Orissa and the Coromandel Coast, Coromandel Coast means Madras, were brought under the control of Fort St. George in Madras. Initially, the Fort St. George at Madras, all the factories and the establishments of the British in Bengal, Bihar, Orissa and Coromandel Coast were controlled. In Eastern India, the English East India Company purchased articles such as cotton, saltpeter, sugar and silk. After purchasing these articles from Eastern India, these articles were exported to Britain and the difference between the purchasing price and the selling price was the profit of the Britishers. However, they could not make much profit because of many tolls and customs. The British merchants were required to pay different kinds of tolls and customs to the local authority. Because of series of efforts, the company was exempted from payment of customs duty in return for a sum to be paid by the company to Indian authorities, that is the Mughal authority. In 1680, the Mughal ruler Aurangasib imposed and collected Jessia on English East India Company and he issued a royal firman making the company's trade customs free except Suraj. However, the customs free trade or duty free trade was granted only to English East India Company. But this Dastaga or duty free or exemption from payment of customs was used by the English officials in their private capacity. English officials used this Dastaga or customs free trade for their private trade, what did it lead? It lead loss of revenue to India. It brought conflict between English East India Company and Mughal ruler Aurangasib. Because the English East India Company officials began to use this duty free for purchasing articles from India and sell in Europe under the private capacity. But a negotiation was entered into 
between the Mughals and the British, following which Aurangzeb pardoned the English on the condition of payment of one lakh fifty thousand rupees as compensation by co paying compensation to the tune of one lakh fifty thousand rupees. The British restored their trade privileges. In 1698, the company got semi-indiary. That is, semi-indiary means the right to collect a tax from three villages: Sudanadi, Govindapur, and Kalikata. From the semi-indiary rights of these three places, the British has got. By paying one thousand two hundred rupees to previous owners, this Kalikata emerged later as Calcutta. In seventeen hundred, the Bengal factories were placed under a separate control of a president and a council in a new fortified settlement called Fort William. In Calcutta, Fort Saint George was at Madras, Fort William at Calcutta. That is why it came into known as Presidency, Calcutta Presidency. In 1700, these settlements were separated from Fort Saint George and placed under the control of the President and a council at Fort William. The village of Kalikata got anglicised name Calcutta and began to flourish as an important centre. Later, it became the capital of the British in India. But it was during the period of Aurangzeb, the powerful ruler. The control was strict, but with the death of Aurangzeb, the strictness of the Mughal Empire came to an end. The successors of Aurangzeb were very weak; they were incapable of checking. The growing European profits. With the death of Aurangzeb, English got more concessions and privileges. What kind of concessions and privileges the British got after the death of Aurangzeb? Let us look into it. In 1717, the Mughal Emperor Farooq Siyar. He was not a powerful ruler like uh, Aurangzeb or Akbar. He was a weak successor of Aurangzeb. He issued a royal firman granting the English East India Company following privileges. What were the privileges the English East India Company received from Farooq Siyar? Have a look on this. The company got a free trade in Bengal without any customs duty in return of an annual payment of thirty thousand rupees. Annually, the East English East India Company was required to make a payment of thirty thousand rupees, but the English East India Company was totally exempted from the payment of any kind of customs duty on the purchase of articles for the sale in Europe. <coughs> on this payment of 30,000 rupees, the English East India Company purchased articles in Bengal and sold it in Europe. Secondly, the English East India Company was allowed to rent more territory around Calcutta. 
Likewise, the company was also exempted from the payment of dues in Hyderabad. They were exempted from the payment of customs duties in Bengal as well as payment of dues in Hyderabad. But in Madras, a different method was adopted wherein the English East India Company was required to pay only existing rent. Another privileges the English East India Company received from Farooq Siyar, the Mughal ruler through this royal firman of 1717. In Suraj, the company was exempted from payment of all dues for an annual sum of 10,000 rupees. Likewise, the English East India Company was allowed to mint the coins at the Bombay and it would be considered as a legal tender. legal tender throughout the Mughal empire. These were the privileges the British got in 1717 from the Mughal ruler Farooq Siyar. Now coming to French, French was the last to appear on the scene. It was Colbert who established the French company in 1664 to enter into Indian trade. The first French factory was established at Surat in 1668. The French was able to establish a factory in Masuli Patanam in 1669. In 1673, the French obtained a grant of a village known as Pondicherry on the east coast. The French got the right to fortify Pondicherry, which later emerged as the center of French settlements in India. The French also received a site near Calcutta in 1674. From the ruler of Bengal, where they built the town of Chandarnagar between 1690-92. However, the French company sent 74 ships to India between 1665, 1669, sorry, 1695. Its activities were smaller compared to English and French companies. The what about the financial position of the French company? The financial position of the French company was very weak. In 1721, the French occupied Mauritius. No doubt, the occupation of Mauritius enabled the French to compete with the English. In 1725, the French was able to establish at Mahi on Malabar coast and Karikal in 1793. The French company was mostly dependent on government. This way we are looking at the factors behind the 
non growing of the French company. What about English East India Company? English East India Company was a private company. It was granted the right to engage in trade through a royal charter in British Crown. It was a private company. While on the other hand, was a government company. It was a weak organization compared to English East India. It lacked the the French company was controlled by the government. These were the differences between English East India and French trading companies. In that there were four, four European countries settled in India for trading purposes. These four European for initially the Portuguese, the by the Dutch with the English to left the scene. English and on the scene. English in this struggle, the English emerged victorious. The English and the French engaged in different wars in Carnatic wars. In these Carnatic wars between the English emerged victorious at the battle of Wandi Wash. In the struggle between English and French, the English also established their supremacy in Bengal. It also helped it. British to establish their over the French. Two battles it was in 1754. The British was able to establish their authority in Bengal, and in another battle was Battle of Bexar. These two battles helped the to establish their authority in Bengal. For in this now the English emerged victorious in these three Carnatic wars, the British was able to defeat the French and through these two battles of Plassey and Bexar, the British was able to establish their political power in Bengal. Thank you students for watching my class. Thank you.
understanding oneself, understanding others, understanding society at large, understanding the nature, these are all driven by basic human curiosity. We would all love to understand why things happen, what happens, what is the final outcome, why certain things fail. These are all exercises that we perform in various domains of knowledge. Therefore, knowledge in various domains you would realize they are actually social artifacts. They have to be rooted into historical perspective, they have to be culturally salient and there would be socio-political reasons behind this. Whether you talk with respect to engineering sciences, whether you talk with respect to physical sciences, biological sciences, social sciences, that is the reason why humanities and social sciences should be understood by all of us. The knowledge that is segregated, that is divided with respect to areas, specializations, all of them needs to be understood in its context. And what provides the context? It is the social reality. How do you correlate knowledge in a given domain with the cultural reality, with the social reality? with the socio-political compulsions. Okay. How do you understand the law of nature okay, in its totality and for doing that you require the understanding of humanities and social sciences. Say for instance, if you are trying to understand the effect of a particular bacteria, a virus, any microbe, how it affects behavior, how it affects the organism, human being. You start looking at it from a pure biological point of view. If you are trying to look at a particular type of a wavelength, say for example, you are emphasizing on the understanding of the effect of radiation on human life. You are looking at things from a physical point of view. You are looking at the corresponding changes inside the body. You are looking at the physiological side of the uh, understanding of the information. You are trying to understand why despite knowing the risk that is inbuilt in the process, why still human beings engage into it. You are looking at it from a pure behavioral point of view. Why society at large admire things which has full of risk? You are trying to understand things from a pure sociological point of view. Why people use particular uh, set of words to explain those experiences? You are trying to understand things from the linguistic point of view. So, there are whole lot of things and then finally, you try to combine all of them to say that what are the guiding principles in life. Then you say you are looking at life, you are looking at humanity from a pure philosophical point of view and this is what social sciences courses provide you. They provide the context to you in which you would be finally positioning the understanding of the knowledge in any given domain. It could be engineering, it could be sciences, it could be medical sciences, it could be social sciences stuff, it could be humanities stuff. So, con contextualizing the knowledge is what humanities social science courses help you obtain.